Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. I'm Anna Summers, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be on February February 3rd, Leveraging Social Networking Resources for Geneolo Genealogical Queries with Annette Adams. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following week for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Maureen Brady, who will be giving a presentation on optimizing your searches on the internet. It's more than family search and ancestry. Maureen Brady is a former school librarian and computer educator. She has over 35 years experience with family history research. She's traced her Scottish roots back to the end of the 17th century and beyond, and also has also pursued Chicago and the Midwest, the Trans-Allegheny, U.S., Quebec, Irish, and Swedish research. Maureen has made numerous presentations to Illinois and Wisconsin genealogical societies, libraries, conferences, and workshops, including presenting at the 2002 National Genealogical Society Conference in the States and the 2016, 2017, 2018 Central Florida Family History Conference. She is a member of the Genealogical Speakers Guild, as well as a life member of the Aberdeen and Northeast Scotland Family History Society, the Chicago Genealogical Society, the Ohio Genealogical Genealogy Society and McHenry County, Illinois Genealogical Society. She's also active in the British Interest Group of Wisconsin and Illinois, the Chicago Scotch Genealogical Group and the Lake County, Illinois Genealogical Society. Maureen, if you're ready, we are excited to um, have you present. And there, here, hoping this works. I'm going to go there. There we go. And well, that's not where it's supposed to be. Hang on. You should see my title screen now, do, do you? I do, looks great. Okay, Okay. so we're gonna talk about just a few websites. Um, when I went out this week and did a Google search and just entered genealogy in the search box, there were over 100 million hits, almost, 100, almost 200 actually, of various places around the internet that have that word somewhere in their web page, either as a title or as content or whatever. Some of them are just individual blogs and individual family websites. Some of them are other websites for research. There's just so much out there. So in one evening, one hour, we really cannot even get into very many of them. But I wanted to show you tonight some of the ones I use most frequently and though I wouldn't use the word favorite, they certainly have been the most useful for my research, which is primarily have been the United States, Canada, the British Isles, and Scandinavia. I have done a little bit in Europe, but not too much. So when you, if you are doing European research, most of this will, will pertain to you, but you may want to look for others as well. So the first one I wanna look at tonight is Cindy's List. I'm starting with the two free sites and I've always loved Cindy's List. This is over 25 years, Cindy has put this together. Cindy Ingle is the girl, the woman behind this. And she started it as a small list of genealogy sites that she was publishing for her local genealogical society. And today there are over 300,000 links on her site. This is her homepage, and what I want you to would think about, there's some very interesting information about the particular site here, but what you need to do is to scroll down from the top to the bottom of that page, and you'll see, as of this week, 318,000 
122 links. Now, some of them are duplicated within the site, but you can still see the size of this. She added 132 new or updated links and so on. They are organized by broad categories. The keyword here is broad. So you're looking at a country or you're looking at an occupation or you're looking at a religion or some major topic. And then it drills down from there. So for instance, all of the states, you must first select United States. If you're working in the United Kingdom, you must first select you because both of those start with you. If you are working in Canada and want to look at Ontario records, you have to start with the letter C. So you start with the broader category and then drill down from there. As an example, we'll take a look at you. I wanted you to also see a rather interesting set category that she's created here. So there's the United Kingdom and Ireland, which was actually updated today. There are over 29,000, almost 30,000 links of various places on the internet that have information pertaining to family history research for the United Kingdom and Ireland. The United States was also updated today, and we have over 157,000 sites with information and research possibilities for the United States. But the one I wanted you to see is this unique peoples and cultures. This is a really interesting category that she's created. And if you take a look here, we have the Black Dutch and the Black Irish and the Matisse who are the Indian French combinations coming out of Canada. But take a look over here at some of her other major categories falling under unique peoples and cultures. We have Germans from Russia, we have Native American orphans and so on. If I take a look at any one of the categories, we're going to look at Native American. When I open that up, we get another category. This is the subcategories, the main categories at the top. And these are the subcategories within Native American. And then again, you pick a category. So we're going to look at general resources. And when I do that, here's the beginning of the general resources for Native American research. And you can take a look quickly through this. We're not gonna take a lot of time to go over every one of these, but mainly what I want you to see tonight is the possibilities and to wet your whistle so that you'll go out tonight or tomorrow or over the weekend and start playing with these sites and seeing what you can find for yourself. So here's a link to the Allen County Public Libraries collection. There is an article here on the American Indian DNA. We have a tribal directory. We have the full three Native American collection, which is extensive. Down here, we have a article by Blaine Benninger, one of the DNA experts on genetic genealogy and Native American DNA. Here's a guide for Native Americans and so on. And there's more after this. This is just the beginning of all of the links she's put together with something to do with Native American family history research. As another example, I picked Utah as a state. And then within Utah, we started with the United States, then I chose the state Utah, and then I chose the category people, ethnicities, nations, and families. And here we can see there are 11 links. And as I take a look down the list, we have online county and town histories, we have a pioneer index for Washington County, pioneers and prominent men of Utah, Icelandic Utah settlement, very, very specific, Utah pioneer certificates and so on. You can see the variety. And yes, perhaps you could find these if you went out and did a Google search, but it's much easier and much faster to just see the list here on Cindy, scan through them and go, here's one I could do. And here's another one I might try and then you just work your way down the list. From my experience, once you get into Cindy, you've got hours worth of work in front of you and you're gonna to have to remind yourself to take a break and go eat something. Another example, she has a huge selection of links for religion and churches. Here's the main subcategories under religion. All of the main ones are represented, including some of the smaller, not so well-known ones such as the Shakers, actually the United Society of Believers and the Second Coming of Christ. But you've got Quakers and Methodists and Mennonites. 
Huguenots, the Baptists, the Catholics, all of these listed separately as their own subcategory and then categories within. So here's one example, religion and churches general. This is under the broad topic. And we have a ChurchNet UK directory. It isn't just the United States. Her links will take you to other parts of the world if that's where your research is leading you. Early American church denominations. This would be the, the colonial and frontier era of the United States. Here's the Evangelical Covenant Church. We have a global Anabaptist Mennonite encyclopedia online, which has quite a bit of information about history, biography, and congregations. And again, this is just the beginning of the section. So something to just for you to go in and explore and scan through and find those little tidbits that'll lead you to something much more uh, useful for you. Here's the occupation categories list. We have the main ones over here on the left, but on the right, she calls them related categories, but these are all occupations, including fur trappers, tra uh, fur traders, trappers, voyageurs, mountain men and explorers. We've got prisons and prisoners and outlaws, timber and lumber industry. I've been working in Northern Wisconsin. That has come in quite handy. There's bridges and dams, canals and rivers and so forth. Each of these is a subcategory within occupations. And then when it, within each of these is another set of subcategories of breaking it down into smaller groups. So here's occupations, apprenticeships. We have the apprentices of Connecticut, child apprentices in America from Christ, from Christ Hospital London, excuse me, 1617 to 1778. That is very, very early in colonial eras. We have East Tennessee's Forgotten Children. Here's London Apprenticeship Abstracts and Apprentices in New York City. And this is just a few. Again, it's just the beginning of the 19 links. But if you have someone who you know was an apprentice or suspect they were an apprentice because they ended up in a trade, this would, could be a very useful set of links for you to check. These are all separate websites, but Cindy puts them together in an organized fashion so that you can find them. Now going on to Family Search and the Research Wiki. Now I said other than Family Search, and this is true, but the Research Wiki at Family Search has also organized various websites, primarily the partner sites with Family Search, into an organized file so that you can quickly find what's available. So if you go into the wiki, and to get to the wiki, you go up here to search. And when that opens up, you come down here to research wiki. So under search, it's the last option. And that opens up this search page. And in this box, I'm going to type the word, either a country or a state, an occupation, a religion, something at that level. So I'm going to type in England. And then when I come up, here's the England Genealogy Wiki page. And this has quite a bit of information on it. This is just the very beginning. But I'm not going to talk about this today. What I want us to focus on is these online records. So down here, we have a blue button. If you click that, it takes you to, a because this is England, a very long list of databases. Now, some of them are on Family Search. But others are at Ancestry, Fold 3, Find My Past, My Heritage, and possibly Billion Graves. So we have church records and vital records. The ones with dollar signs means it will take you to a subscription site if you open that one up. The Catholic Heritage Collection, for instance, is England and Wales Birth Index. But if you look up at these, these do not have dollar signs. So these are free sites, either on Family Search or on another free website. And here we have church records together. Then we get into birth baptisms, birth baptisms and christenings as separate ones. These are ones that contain all of it. If you look over here, we start with military records, starting with pre-World War I. If I keep going, we go to marriages. The deaths would be after it. There's World War I. And that would continue to World War II and so on. We even have a 
group for civil divorce records of England and Wales from 1858 to 1918. I haven't had an opportunity to try that yet, but that could be very interesting for some people who suspect there was a divorce in the family. We have biographies, we have cemeteries, and here's World War I, but now it's broken out into the Air Force, the Navy Marines, Merchant Marine, and even a huge collection, at least by my standards for this, women's forces of World War I in England, in the British Isles. And we've got army nurses, we have Royal Air Force. From World War I, women in the Royal Air Force, that's quite interesting, and so on. So you can see how this works. It goes on for quite a length of, of records for England. For states, it's not nearly as long. For some states, very long. For some states, not so much. But it takes all of the ones from the partner sites the Family Search works with and groups them together by category so you can quickly find them in the wiki. So that's why I include the wiki so you can see all these other possibilities. We have uh, passports, periodicals, school records, tax records, voter lists, and these are just a few that I selected. There are more than this. It includes on all of these, the periodical source index which is a index to the periodical collection at the Allen County Public Library. And it allows you to search periodical articles in the newsletters and journals and uh, magazines that various genealogical societies around the world have published. They send a copy of their publication to Allen County. Allen County indexes it and goes into the periodical source index. This is very, very useful because you can look it up by place name as well as surname. So I've used this quite a bit and I've found quite a bit of information in the periodical source index. This is a very, very important source and it comes up in the wiki for every one of these lists of what's online. Keeping going, we've got prisoners, directories, immigration, emigration, and passenger lists. And you can see here we've got African company, early immigration, alien arrivals to England. There's quite a bit here. Now, one thing to remember, this is England. So if they're coming from the Commonwealth to England or from the colonies to England, that's going to be emigration, not immigration because they are moving within the British Empire. So may, remember that when you're working on British family history. Okay, so that is the geographical section and the what's online section for Wiki. But Wiki has one other really good help that I wanted you to know about. It's not a research site, but it is something that's very useful for those of us who have to get into foreign languages that we don't know. Wiki has word lists, and these are glossaries and language helps. So when you're on the search page, in the search box, type genealogical word list, just those three words like that, and it'll come up with a list of every single one of these genealogical word lists. There's over 80 of them, the last I checked. And you can see we have Indonesian, Finnish, as well as French and Spanish and Polish, Italian, Czech, Latin is good for anyone who's doing Catholic records. And there's, as I said, there's over 80 of these. So I'm going to show you Polish as an example of what's in these. First comes up a very basic background of what is involved in, in what's the, in this language, particular characteristics. As this is Polish, it tells me what was used when, when each of the various countries were in charge. So Russian, Poland, German, Poland, Austrian, Poland. And then it gives me the alphabet as they write it, in the order they write it. And it points out that the letters Q, the English letters, Q, V, and X are not used unless it's for a foreign name or word. And it gives all the little accent points and everything. And I find this useful for two reasons. One is, here's my alphabetical order. But if I need to write this character right here in my records, 
I can come to this page in the wiki and copy and paste this into my name or into my database and it works beautifully. So it's a little bit cumbersome, but it's one way to be able to type all of these odd characters that Polish has quite a bit of. Then if you keep going, we get a discussion of word variants, meaning plurals and words ending in A change to a Y and so forth, giving you some examples. And then the key words we look for in our records, birth, burial, and so on. And the English word is on the left and the Polish words are on the right. And you can see for some of these, there may be more than one option, especially if I take a look down here at wife, there's four different words for the word wife. But this is a quick little checklist. This comes as a PDF document that you can print or save, and then you can have it for a reference when you're doing your own research. And then after the keywords, we have an A to Z mini dictionary. It's not every word, but it's the word you are most likely to come across as you're working through the records with the Polish on this side and the English on this side. And it's a wonderful little dictionary and very, very useful. And as I said, there's over 80 of these word lists and I did want you to know about them. So that's the end of the freebies. Now we move on to the subscription sites, I think. Oops, I went too fast. The first thing I wanna talk about is newspapers. Newspapers can be a wealth of information, not only for things like obituaries, which is what most of us think about, but marriage announcements, engagements announcements, birth announcements, when somebody moves in, when somebody moves out, when a cousin is visiting, when an aunt and uncle has, has died somewhere else and the family has gone off to visit them. All these little tidbits can be found in, in these newspapers and they aren't just available now for the United States. I'll show you a couple of other options. <clears throat> they are spreading across into various parts of Europe as well. But for the United States, Chronicling America is the place to start. It is sponsored by, let me show you the homepage, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress. It is hosted on a Library of Congress webpage. So it has, does have .loc in it. The humanities provide the grants and then the Library of Congress provides the web space. That's how the two work together in their partnership. This is a project that's been ongoing and will be ongoing for quite a while. And what it is trying to do is it, giving grants to small archives around the country, a county archive perhaps, or local genealogical societies or local libraries who have large collections of the local newspaper. And then they grant, they give them grant money to give them the funds to get those papers digitized. And once they're digitized, then the Library of Congress gets the copies. It goes on the Library of Congress site. And because these are printed newspapers, they use OCR, optical character recognition software to search all of these printed words in every single digitized newspaper. It is an amazing source, and especially for small towns. There is not really much here for the larger cities. The larger cities, many of them have done their own digitization programs, or they have another way of doing it. But this is aimed at the small town newspapers across the country from whatever county they may be in. The best way to start is to go up here to the all digitized newspaper tab. Now you're gonna to wanna to jump right in and search, but the first thing you really wanna do is go here to the digitized newspapers, click there, and now you can pick your state and an ethnicity if you wish. So I'm going to pick Wisconsin and just make it all ethnicities in all languages. I want to see the entire list of newspapers that had been digitized for the state of Wisconsin. So up comes my list. It tells me there are 61. Oops, I went too fast, sorry. And here's my list. Now, if you notice, they are in alphabetical order 
by the name of the newspaper, not by the location. So we start with Ashland and then Baraboo, but here's a German volume coming out of Nina and another one out of Milwaukee, another one out of Milwaukee. And then we have Dodgeville and you can see as you move down the line, the paper names are alphabetical, but not the place. So you need to scan the entire list to identify any potential newspapers for the area you're working in. And also be sure to watch the time frame. Now it does tell you here, but it also tells you earliest issue and latest issue for each of these newspapers. So the Ashland Chronicle is from 1916, no, September 9th, from to 1916, September 23rd. One month, not even quite a month, of the newspaper called the Ashland Chronicle. Now you might luck out. That might be the exactly when you need it but that's really not a very broad period of time. Here's a 10 year period. Here's one that goes on for 20. Here's another narrow one. If we come down a little further, this is oh, about 35 years. So you can see they're all a little different. It tells you the number of issues as well. So here's this German paper out of Nina and it's 1,573. This actually might be Scandinavian, Danish. But there's 1,573 issues of the newspaper covering about 21 years. So you would go through here, look to see what's available for your area, then come over and see if it's the right time frame. If it is, then you click the browse issues and it takes you to that newspaper and you can browse your way through it. Now, if you have identified exactly where a newspaper might be, or you've identified a particular newspaper, then you can go to advanced search. And when you do that, you can pick the name of the paper. All of the papers on Chronicling America are listed in this box, in this drop down list in alphabetical order by the name of the paper. Or you can choose the state over here to search. So I can search in here for the name Brady in the state of Missouri. And I can pick a time frame. I can do exact years or I can do a date range, but don't fill in too much at first. Wait to see what you get. And then if you have to add more choices. So just the word Brady in this time frame and in the state of Missouri. And I get 7,152 pages with that hit on it. It's actually hits. Now, if you see all of these little red boxes, tell me where that word Brady occurs. Now I have a very common name, so you're going to see a lot of this. This is the first kind of advanced search when you do it by state, but it's going to do the entire state. So really the best way to do it is to select your newspaper. And I would start with, let me see what's available. Once I figured that out, then I can come back here, find my paper, the Iron County Register. They lived in Iron County. Here's my time frame. I changed it a little bit, just the word Brady. And then I hit my search. And now I have 77 pages of the Iron County Register in that short frame of time with the word Brady somewhere on a page. And you can see there's usually more than one. Now, again, some of these aren't going to be about my family because there was a Judge Brady in New York who was a national news and so forth. But some of this will be, and I actually found my great grandmother's obituary in 1897 in this newspaper, and, and it told me where she was born, her birth date, when she came to the United States, when she married my great grandfather, gave me her death date, burial date, and so on. Wonderful little article to find, and the only record I'd have of her death. So that's chronicling America. You'll have a lot of fun with this if you have small town families that you're looking for. And this one is free. Chronicling America is free because it's from the Library of Congress. Now, my, if you need to find all of the newspapers that ever were published, not just digitized, but that actually existed, you can also come over, this is still on Chronicling America, come over to this US newspaper directory and you select the state and the county 
and the time frame if you wish. So I'm going to look for New York, Oneida County, and Rome, and I'm going to keep that wide open. And when I do that, here are all of the newspapers that have been published in Rome, Oneida County, New York at some point in time. And again, it'll give you the years. And there are, you notice this is the first 20 of 40. So there were 40 different newspapers published in this town at some point. You can then open it up and find out if that particular newspaper is in a library near you or is on another website, or if in fact it's here on the digitized Chronicling America. So there's two different ways to do this, looking for the digitized papers themselves or coming to the all of the newspaper list to identify every newspaper that's published in your part of the United States. Now let's move on to the subscription newspaper websites. Newspaper archive, I start with this one because it is free to use at the um, Family History Centers sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and many, many libraries have it as well. So newspaper archive, the best way to start here is again to start with the publications list. Actually, it should be the browse. I had it on the wrong one. It's to start on the, no, I'm sorry. It was publications. I'm confused. Easy to do when you go from one to the other. So I go to publications list and here is every newspaper in the order it's been updated or added. It's not alphabetical. It's not by place. It's not by state. It's in the order it was added. So it isn't an easy list to use because there, it goes on for a very, very, very long time. And you really have to be very careful when you're scanning the city list that you're not missing your city. You could do a control find to put in the name of the city and it would get you there faster. But that, in my experience, it still has missed one or two. So the best way to do this is to do the box search. Let me go back one, I forgot to do it down here, up here rather under location. I can put in my city or my state up here and then I get the list for just that state. So here's Tennessee. And again, they're not in alphabetical order either by name of newspaper or by the name of the city. It's by the order it was added but you get a good look at what's available and here's the years they're available. For instance, I thought this was interesting. Chattanooga Daily Rebel published between 1862 and 1864. There's 223 pages. If you were doing a project on the Civil War, this could be a very interesting newspaper to read to see the viewpoint of the Southern states about that war. We also have Kingsport and Nashville. This is a Latin, La, Latina paper from uh, Mexico, or at least Mexican evangelical of some sort. We've got a matrimonial register in a Knoxville journal. You can see the variety here. So that's under publications. And then you go to location and you pick your state, and then that helps you narrow down the list. If you do the search function at Newspaper Archive, you get this screen. And you can fill in as much of this as you want, but the more you fill in, the less likely you are to get what you're looking for. So usually what I start with is fill in this um, surname, maybe a keyword, I'll pick a time frame, and I'll pick a state. So I'll do surname, maybe a keyword, a time frame, and a state, and then I'll get my list. It's very forthright and very, very easy to use. So I'm not showing you an example, but it's two ways. First, you can look at the list of the papers under publications or do the search and then start with the minimal and work your way if you have to keep narrowing it down. The second site is newspapers by uh, newspapers.com. This is now an ancestry owned website and they include at this point, Papers from the United States, Australia, Canada, Ireland, Panama, and the United Kingdom. Now it is a subscription site, 
but they is free at some public libraries. Some libraries have started to carry this. So you would want to check with your local library. So at newspapers.com, this is their main page. And again, I would start with what's available first. Do they have a newspaper that it could be of use to me? So I start down here in locations, same idea as the previous one. Pick on the United States, and then it gives me this screen. First, it shows me this column. So I pick a country, then it opens up to a second column, and I'll pick an appropriate here. So I'm doing Nova Scotia. Then it opens up the third column, in this case, the city. So I'm doing Halifax, Nova Scotia. And now finally, once I've selected that, it shows me the newspapers that are in newspapers.com for Halifax, Nova Scotia. I pick my newspaper and then it shows me the years that it is available. So it starts with just one column. You pick your country and then it opens up across your screen until you get to your last screen and then you would pick your year. Now this is to browse through a newspaper edition for a year. It is not terribly hard to do, but it is, you are going to get the entire year at one time. The other way is to use their search box. There are only three options at newspapers.com. Don't let that discourage you, however. With a little bit of ingenuity and a little bit of creativity, you can usually find what you're looking for. So you add a key name or a name, a data range, and then a location. So I'm going to look for the keyword Lindsay. In this case, it's a surname from the period 1860 to 1900 in Jackson County, Illinois. I'm just doing a surname. I could add in here a first name if I wanted to, but be aware if you put more than one word here, it's going to search individually for each of those words, not together. It will give you the ones where all of them show first, but it doesn't look at it as a phrase or a name, as individual keywords. So I usually just start with one and then in my time frame and my place. And I hit my little search button and I get four matches for the word Lindsay from 1860 to 1900. Here's a little bit of a clip of the article. Here's the, the newspaper where it was published and the date. And then I can open this up if I'm, I can double click on this and it'll give me the full page that I can then clip, save or do whatever I want. You, there usually is enough here for you to tell whether it might be a useful article. This one is something about a lawyer, Lindsay, massive evidence, it sounds like a trial. Down here, we have a group of speakers and something about the constitution and the legislation. So usually you can tell. There's only four matches from the word Lindsay. Some others I've done in this particular area of Southern Illinois, Jackson County, Illinois. Sometimes I've come up with 50 and 60 hits, depending on the word I'm looking for, the surname and so on. I have found a lot of success on the newspapers.com for large areas of the United States, primarily again, however, rural, not exclusively, but there's a lot of rural newspapers on here too. Genealogy Bank is another newspaper site that is a subscription site. Again, some libraries have started to subscribe to this. Check with your, your local library. Genealogy Bank has a 30 day free trial, however, which you can then use and cancel on day 28. Not exactly a nice thing, but you could do it. You didn't hear me say it. Their search window, they give you one right here, but there is the advanced search. So when I open this up, this is the advanced search window, but you notice you have some options up here. So the browse, will give you the list of newspapers just as on the other sites. And it takes you to a selection of by state. You open up, you click on the state, and then it will show you on this website, on Genealogy Bank, the newspapers that are included for that state. 
the full reason this is the advanced search again be careful don't fill in too much but you can do first and last name you can do exact but i would be careful with that especially because this is an ocr search <clears throat> um, engine ocr optical cop optical character recognition it's looking at those printed letters some of which might be smeared or a little bit off center and so isn't exactly right readable and so the ocr software guesses so exact name search is going to limit you quite a bit you can put your range in you can put a few keywords or you can exclude keywords if you wish for instance if i was doing brady i would probably exclude judge because I know there's going to be a lot about that Judge Brady in New York. You pick your states, your cities, and so on, and then you hit your search key. So here's, I'm going to show Michael Brady. This is my great-great-grandfather. And he lived in Kenosha, Wisconsin from before 1860 to 1890. And so I put in that date range, Kenosha and Wisconsin. I'm not choosing a newspaper. And if I do a search, I get 95 hits, 95 articles that have Brady in it. Do you see this? But one of them has Michael Brady, even though they didn't highlight the Michael. And so this is an AC Brady. I'm not sure what this one is down here. Here's Mason Brady, Karen. It sounds like a law group or something of that sort. Down here, we have the date and the location and the name of the paper. But Michael Brady died in this city, October 31st, 17th. And so I'm 114 years old. And it's from New Lisbon, Wisconsin. This turns out to be the obituary for my great, great grandfather, not in Kenosha, but in another town in Wisconsin. And I actually found one in London for him because apparently because he was 114 years old. So don't limit yourself. It's one of the reasons I show you this. Don't limit yourself to just the town or county they lived in. Expand it out to statewide because sometimes it's picked up by another small town newspaper that needed to fill in space in their paper that day. You never know where these little tidbits could show up. So that's the end of newspapers. So now we're going to look at fold three. This is again free to use at the family history centers. And it's primarily military. So when you open it up, <clears throat> you can see here we've got United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom. And then the United States is red and it's broken down into all the various military periods. And then also there's African-American, Native American, and non-military. But what you need to do is see all titles. When you go there, <clears throat> it's an alphabetical list of all of their databases, starting with Admiralty. <clears throat> but over here, you can filter by choosing a period for a war or the type of a publication you're looking for. And then it will narrow it down there. So you get a little bit, you get a smaller list, or you can spend your time going through every single one of these databases. There's over 2000 of them at fold three. So I went and here's the war of 1812 filtered for that era. And here's a list of all of, starting with the beginning of the list of databases concerning the records of the war of 1812. We've got Army Register of Enlistments. Here's Canada, final payment vouchers, foreign burials, Ireland's Royal Hospital. This is in that time frame. There would have been Irish and English and Welsh and Scottish soldiers fighting on the other side from our viewpoint. So I filtered the War of 1812, and this gives you an example of what that looks like. If I filter to Australia, we have five databases for Australia as of today. Airmen died in the Great War, that's World War I, remember. Here's some World War II. And then we have Tasmanian Return Soldiers Settlement Land Records. Now very narrow in purpose, but it might be exactly what you're looking for. C, 
city directories. Fold three has a wonderful collection, excuse me a moment, of city directories. And if you take a look on the right here, Baltimore, Boston, Brooklyn, Buffalo, Chicago. Most of these are on the shelves at the Allen County Public Library or in microfilm there. And they've taken them and digitized them. They're really easy to use. Once you pick your city, then it's organized by year and you can work your way through. It, uh, it's not very difficult at all. And you can see the spread here and that it even goes on after Indianapolis. The city directories here at Fold3 are very, very useful if you are working in urban research in these cities. So moving on to find my past, I know I'm moving fast, but we've got only an hour. Again, this is free to use at the Family History Centers and a lot of libraries have it. Find my past started out with an emphasis on the British Empire, but they have expanded worldwide. So you can choose up here what part of the world you're going to work in. But down here, there's a section of quick links with the birth, marriage, all the major categories here. Parish records are primarily of the British Isles and primarily Anglican Episcopalian records, just as a warning. But you can pick any of these or you can look at the, all of the record sets and you get a set of over 2,600 different record sets here at Find My Past. Now, when it comes up, it's not in any kind of order. We have censuses mixed in with social security, mixed in with passenger lists. So you would have to scan through this entire list to be able to identify everything. But it's my one complaint about Find My Past. They have a lot of wonderful records, but they don't make it real easy to find the database. Sometimes you can find it this way with the quick links, but even then some of the ones that are on this side don't get listed over here. And some of the ones that are over here may or may not be listed on this side. So you've got to check both. Also their search, this is their search screen in Find My Past. And it asks for a lot of detail, but you don't have to answer everything. You can just do United States, Canada. You can choose a location if you want to. They've now added this little radius scale. So you can go, if I'm looking for somebody from Boston, but you can look out 50 miles from Boston if you wish to. You can do years of, a year of the, of the paper or the um, event or the birth or the death. You can narrow things down. You can browse your subcategories to figure out when to put in here. But again, I don't put in too much. I start with the least name and I'll usually put in just a year range and then my country, maybe a place. You have to really dig in. You have to be sometimes come back and do some adjustments to your search. It's not easy to find things and find my past, but they have some wonderful, wonderful nuggets that will not be found anywhere else and it's worth the effort. And to show you one example, <clears throat> this is the British Army pensioners from 1783 to 1822. And this is my fourth great grandfather, Private William Hunter, tells me he was born in Skeen near the town of Aberdeen in the county of Aberdeen. He enlisted on the fifth day of August, 1806 at age 30 years. Now it gives me a ballpark for his birth. Here's his information about where he's, what units he say served in and when. So it tells me where he was born, his approximate age. This is definitely my William Hunter. He served in the army for the space of 19 years. And then what I really love about this particular document, on the back side, it gives a physical description. When he's discharged, He's 42 years of age, five feet, eight inches in height, black hair, hazel eyes, sallow complexion, and by trade was a laborer. You're not going to find this kind of information on too many documents or record sources. 
but I found it here at Find My Past by digging, being patient, trying different things, and this document finally came up. The interesting thing to me is my mother had black hair, hazel eyes, and sallow complexion. And this was her three times great-grandfather. So traits do come down. One other thing about Find My Past is if you scroll all the way to the bottom of the home page and find the little things at the bottom where it talks about the FAQs and how to contact us and so forth, they do have a selection of free genealogy records, primarily censuses, that you do not have to subscribe to this site to use. Google is my last site I wish to talk about. I always use Google as, kind of, it's not a last resort, but after I've looked at everything else, I just wanna see if I've missed something. So here's Michael Brady Kenosha again, and I did Michael Brady in quotes. So it treats it as a phrase. And then I also want it to include the word Kenosha. I spelled that wrong. No, I didn't, sorry. And this is what came up. This is a query that was posted back in 2005 at the website cousinconnect.com. And somebody posted this query about her great-grandfather, her great-great-grandfather, Michael Brady, had a wife, Anne, and so on. <clears throat> well, I happened to, I read through the whole thing because it was Michael and it was Kenosha. And here is my great-grandfather. And he did live in Dalton and he did live in Chicago in those years. And so I responded to this. It was still a valid email address. And it turned out to be my cousin living about 25 miles from me. And I had not seen her in about 40 years. She's actually, she's my generation, but she's about 30 years older than me, well, 20. And she clued me into Michael's daughter moved to Indiana. And uh, the whole side of that family lived in Indiana which I had no idea about until I took a chance and responded to this query, which I found through a Google search. So always try one. You never know what you're going to find. So some quick research strategies, because we are definitely running out of time. First of all, when you're going to do your search, check what you can do. Can you use wildcards? Will that website allow you to use wildcards for vowels or ends of letters? or even for a beginning first letter. What does that website allow you to do? And that makes it really easy for the various spelling variations that come up because of double letters and vowels and so on. Also, look to see what is included in the search window. So here's newspaper archive. We can do name and keywords and time frame, and we can do a country and a state, but compare that to newspapers.com which just gives you three choices, a keyword or name, a date, and a place. You really can't narrow that down too much. And then if you take a look at Find My Past, they not only do every the names, but they give you three different types of dates. They give you the chance of really narrowing it down, how far out you want to go on a radius and even into categories. So take a look at what you can search before you decide what you're going to search, what you're going to use, because that will make a big difference as to what you may find. Think about what is actually recorded on census records, birth certificates, marriage licenses, and death certificates. Death certificates may have a birth date, but they don't usually have a marriage date. Marriage licenses definitely don't have death, death dates. Census records give you ages, rarely give you any kind of idea of a birth date. Canada does, 1900 does, and so on. So think about what's on the record that you're looking for, and then do your search accordingly. And start with less is more. Start with less information, and then narrow down if you get too many hits. Don't make assumptions. This is so important. I had a great uncle, his name was John Forsyth Robertson, and I could not find him in the 1930 census. I finally had to do it by an ED search, knowing his address. 
and the 1930 enumerator wrote his name as John R. Forsaith. So don't assume they're going to spell it right or even anything close to right. If you can't find it by name, try other ideas. Another thing about no assumptions, here's my great grandfather, the one that Puri was inquiring about, Henry Michael Brady. He was born about 1847 in Wisconsin and his parents were both born in Ireland. I went to the 1900 census, I had found him up to that point and I used Henry Brady about 1847, Wisconsin and Ireland and the only hit in the entire country, in all of the country, is this one, Henry Brady in Elva Woods County, Oklahoma. This is the approximate correct birth date. It does say Wisconsin, Ireland, Ireland. Wrong wife, wrong children, at least as far as I knew. So I just totally discounted this. I assumed it was not him. And I assumed I couldn't find him, that he was missed. And then I met that cousin who put that little query up. And she told me, well, yes, Henry lived in a ranch down in Oklahoma with his second wife. So this was, in fact, my great my great grandfather. But I did not know that until I connected with someone and was able to do the research from her clues. Don't discount. Don't assume. Think outside the box. If you can't find them by a name, just don't use the name. So 1920, looking for his daughters. They were all born five years either side of 1875 in Illinois. Their father was born in Wisconsin and their mother was born in Ireland. Now this will only work if these three places are an unusual combination. If they're all one state, this will not work. But if it's unusual enough, try it. And I came up with one of his daughters, Laura Catherine, and her second husband, Fred W. Wilson, living in Chicago. And I didn't find it by looking for Laura. I looked it for it by somebody born the right time, in the right place, with parents born in the right place. Think of other ways and creative ways you can manage your searches. And then develop your own knowledge base, I call it. Make a list of the various variations you've found for your first names, your surnames, and your given names. So here's the ones I found for Brady. Here's Elizabeth, quite a long list, but this will help you because if it's really not working with Elizabeth, or you can work your way down through Elspeth and Elsie and Bessie and Isabel and Lizzie and so forth. And it may be because they're using one of these other forms of the name instead of Elizabeth in that particular record. Spelling substitutions. Be aware of those, and that's why wild cards come in handy. This is white. This is the uh, 17th century version of white. This is a good German name. I'm not even sure if it's pronounced Euler, but that's how I pronounce it. But in various documents for the same person, it's been spelled all three ways. So I keep record of that. And you notice not even Soundex would work with here because it's O, I, and E. Keep a track of place name changes as well. In Illinois, we have a town called Libertyville, but its original name was Independence Grove. So if you were to find a newspaper, for instance, published in Independence Grove, you would need to be aware that that actually is Libertyville. So I make a list of appropriate name changes for county for places. So I know that I am aware of these kinds of things when I'm looking through the records in the newspapers. Finally, check multiple sites. Every one of them is indexed separately. The US Census, for example, is on Family Search, Ancestry, Fold 3, Find My Past, and My Heritage. They all have different indexes. They've been indexed through different methods. You might find it on Fold 3 and no place else because the handwriting wasn't read correctly, or it might be just somebody didn't understand cursive. We have that problem today with some people. So look at more than one site. If the first one you use and you can't find it, and it's available on another site, go try it there too, especially if you're in a public library or the Family History Centers, and you have an opportunity to try some of these subscription sites. 
So finally, good hunting. And I now go back to stop share. And I think we have a few minutes for questions, Anna. Yeah. Well, maybe a, maybe a couple. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I can start off the Q&A. Um, which one of these methods is your favorite to use? Methods or websites? Both. I, either or. <laughs> okay. Um, for newspapers, my first go-to is Chronicling America. My second is newspapers.com. Only because of where I'm researching, they have the most options for me. It might be totally different for you. For the methods, I try to start with the barest minimum, meaning a surname, a range of dates, never a specific date, and a location such as a county or a state. And then if I get way too many hits, I'll start narrowing it down after that, maybe adding a first name, and maybe adding a narrower time frame or something along those lines. But I'll start with, give me the most, and then let me whittle it, whittle it down myself. Does that make sense? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions today, just a lot of people saying thank you. Um, so thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and yeah, um, let me pull up my little... Yeah, thank you, Maureen. That was just a fabulous webinar. Um, I really enjoyed learning about how to look up things better. <laughs> um, I do research here, um, papers and stuff, so that really helps. Um, and we hope you'll join us for our next webinar, which will be, um, and thank you everybody for coming. We hope you'll join us next week um, with leveraging social networking resources for genealogical queries, queries with Anna Adams. Um, and a recording of this webinar will be made available next week. And you can view that on our YouTube channel and our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone. <laughs>